Engaging in interdisciplinary research is not easy. All of us in the room here knows it. It requires being re interested in research broadly. Um, and all of us, we've been trained in this very, very narrow field. So what it means is that we have to lift our eyes up and look a little bit higher. We have to learn the nuances of other disciplines. We have to understand the semantics and language of other disciplines. We have to slow down. And we're all working so fast. We're great at what we do. We know this particular nodule very, very well, and we can plow through with it. But in order to solve some of the bigger problems, we need to take time to learn other languages and to work together. And working together as well involves logistics. It means moving from the physics building to the chemistry building. And boy, that's tough maybe in February. Huh? <coughs> Professor Charlie Trick, our inaugural recipient of the Falona Family Interdisciplinary Science Award, is a man with a mission with drive and self-described as a transdisciplinary scientist. He's a faculty member in the Department of Biology and in the Interfaculty Program in Public Health. Charlie, together with his students, has contributed theoretical and practical insights into socio-ecological problems affecting government policies, industry practices, and communities at risk. His basic science has fundamentally changed global interest in fertilizing the oceans, and his research program has morphed into a global seafood safety program with community-based sentinel systems in Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Cook Islands, and Guatemala. Please join me in giving a warm welcome for the 2014 and our inaugural recipient of the Fenona Family Interdisciplinary Science Award, Charlie Trick. Well, good afternoon. I'm um, absolutely humbled to be here. Uh, the students gave remarkable talks. Um, I am um, just blown away by the quality of their work and the speed at which they can present their work. <laughs> I will admit that it's slowing down a lot right now. Um, but congratulations, it's fantastic. I'm also humbled by being invited here with the Flona family to have this award and to give this talk. In my talk before the presentation, I learned a lot about the family and they are remarkable people. Their contribution to be able to constantly hold and promote interdisciplinary um, studies, I think will uh, benefit Western for a long time to come. And it will bring out, I think, some of the strengths of Western that we sometimes forget. And that is, uh, we're smarter than just in our discipline. And that given the chance to talk amongst the other disciplines, we'll discover all sorts of new things. And um, anyways, I. Uh, I really appreciate very much the opportunity to be able to share my thoughts on this. So thank you for making this happen. I'd also like to thank the Dean's Office. Um, it takes a lot of work to start something new, to make changes. Uh, you, can, you may have noticed that universities are sometimes sluggish at times, and they sometimes don't move with the, the era. But I'm gonna try to show in my talk a little bit that the questions being asked now are so different than the questions being asked 30 years ago, at least in my field, that interdisciplinary understanding and appreciation is going to be, you know, the, the new norm. That we can't sit back in our, in our offices and just do what's in our commoner understanding. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm always a little embarrassed to talk about myself, so I'm not going to talk about myself today. I'm going to talk about my friend over there on, the left, on your right-hand side, the beautiful diatom Sirenitia. Now, for people that have been here for some time, they recognize that diatom, that's a strange word. We don't talk about organisms at this university. We only talk about processes. Well, I'm going to have to give you a little um, kind of primer on how that organism 
uh, changed my life, but also may change how uh, we view the oceans and how we view things that, such as seafood. So let me start off. It's like a class. There's a kind of brilliant ways to start classes. The best is, you know, some sort of really profound thought, um, but I will do it differently. I'm going to give you a quiz. That's the best way to start. Okay, the quiz is this. There's two fallacies in this figure, in this uh, movie. You gotta find them. One's factual, and one year, makes you gonna think, that just doesn't make any sense. All right? One's factual, and this just doesn't make any sense. I should point out that there is no sound. <laughs> no, that's just somebody playing the piano. He'll be back. <laughs> well, that's the question. Who asked the question? Professor Hill suggests that maybe the problem is he's not okay. And she obviously can tell that it's a male. <laughs> <laughs> So, any thoughts? There we go. We can move next. Okay, so, are we okay with this? This looks good? I should point out that this is what happens when you put instruments from a ship in the water. Because marine life, life like this, just they just find things amazing and they find things, oh, that's really cool. Let me go look at that instrument. So you're trying to measure something very nice and some sort of Oh, what was that? Sea lion, it said? Uh, it's not a sea lion. That's where the factual problem is. It's a fur seal. The person that, <laughs> one of our students did the movie and then was told about the taxonomy a little later. Um, but they'll come and visit. That's the factual problem. But the thing that says this shouldn't be happening is this is some of the most toxic water associated with the coast of North America. And it's toxic to almost every marine mammal, except the fur seal. And I have no idea why. Someday I'd like to know that answer. And the field, field, fur seal is probably very happy that he's the only one in the water and has a whole ocean to himself as long as that water remains toxic. When you looked at the picture, you probably just looked at the big seal. Shame on you. For every one mil of water in there, there's 20 million photosynthetic toxic cells. They're just small. They shaped that whole community, and they shaped my life. And what I would like to now do is start from that point on to where we are as an oceanographer to public health using this one example. So when I started uh, some years ago from Western, and I'll tell you that in a few minutes, I was an oceanographer, I came here, and these were the types of visions I had of the ocean. All positive. I did a little yoga on the beach, everybody was happy, caught a little fish. Anybody know that fish? There are zoologists in the room. It's a wahoo. And you know, they're digging for clams here. Ah, clams. It's a great recreational sport, but very dangerous. And of course, there's the, just a serenity of the ocean as well. Let's see. Ah. But this is what more modern problems of the ocean are like, and these are the ones that shape the modern questions of research. They're the ones where funding is available for now that weren't really available before because they were not a real pro they were not a problem. Plastics in the ocean, you can't, I mean, it's really hard to explain to individuals 
how much plastic ends up in the ocean. Everything goes downstream on this earth, and the ocean is that last downstream deposit. There is uh, both industrial and nutrient waste under our coastal waters. Great place to throw everything. Some of cities, famous cities in Canada, still put their sewage directly into the ocean, thinking nobody's going to see it, nobody's going to really notice. But we do depend on the ocean. They do notice. On the right-hand side, there is Vibrio cholera. Uh, I think it's one of those species that it's inhabiting the ocean, parts of the ocean. It's where it's hiding. Okay, we have um, diseases that find a reservoir to hide before they come back and have an impact with humans. Its prevalence in the ocean is on the increase because, among the other things, the other two things on top that are changing. And on the, the far left-hand side is the scariest picture I could ever find about the ocean. Here is somebody that gets his livelihood by diving for oysters. Oysters grow where there's a lot of food. Oysters filter food from the water. The best food for oysters to filter is sewage. So here's a man, sewage on the left, him on the right, diving for his livelihood. Now you can see there might be a public health risk here. Okay, I think when you swim in sewage to get enough money to feed your family, there's a public health issue. So these are the types of questions that say, modern oceanographers have to deal with. So remarkably different. But when I was hired here, I wasn't hired as an oceanographer, but as a phycologist. Now that name might not ring a bell anymore, but phycologists are in, in people that study the algae, the, photosynth the small photosynthetic cells. And this is probably the type of information that was in the ad for Western in 1987, go I count backwards, yes, I know, long time ago, um, saying, we need somebody to study the algae. They're photosynthetic protists, they're small, they're a division of the life, sci the life sciences, and they're really important in, with regards to their ecology, their physiology, their growth, that's it. Unfortunately, the ad I saw was from the Globe and Mail. And not that there's a problem with the Globe and Mail, but they had, they had a problem, yeah, spelling phycologist, and it did say psychologist. So, somehow, I skimming over the want ads, so I didn't point out the algae, an algal psychologist? Oh, cool. And, and I laughed at this for decades. Oops, sorry. But as my research changed, I recognized that actually, I need to be a bit of a psychiatrist now, or a psychologist. Because the questions have changed so that so the social aspects of the ocean inter intersecting with the ecology of the cells is foremost. And so many of the questions I ask now are, are more appropriate to this slide than the one I was hired to do. And I actually thank science, and I thank uh, actually Schulich School as well, for allowing me to have that ability to shift my research to include other disciplines. I, I, I never knew if that would be acceptable or not. Or finally somebody would say, Trick, I have no idea why you're here. Go find another department. Uh, so they haven't said that yet. Okay. so. Here's a primer. Since we don't teach about organisms that photosynthesize or organisms at this university any longer, I have to teach you about it. And you have one minute to learn to be a combination of phycologist and oceanographer. Uh, I, it took me longer than one minute to learn this, but you get one minute. So phytoplankton, those small cells, are the lifelines of our Earth. They provide sufficient amount of oxygen. They do 40% of the new oxygen on a daily basis. In a cheap, cheap way, they're often referred to as the plants of the ocean. But they're not plants. Other than the fact they photosynthesize, 
They are in their own subgroup, the protists. Here's what they look like. Aren't they beautiful? I always tease my students, I want you to ever see these under the microscope. There's no sense ever going back to your other discipline. You just fall in love with them. Now, if you look at those, I mean, there's, there's you know, something in the range of 3,500 different genera of phytoplankton. And we're only going to learn like 2,000 today. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we're only going to learn a couple. But the ones here, they're very common marine species. And when you look at them, you can just say, you know, ooh, go ahead, you can say ooh. Ooh, yeah, I know, they're so beautiful. <laughs> and that most of them have a very rigid outer skeleton, which is made up of silica. All right, and I won't even go into the, the game I usually play with the students, but the silica is the same material that's ground up in your toothpaste to give it an <coughs> abrasive material. So everybody now checks their teeth. Mm, yeah, okay, I did brush today. Okay, so they have a, many of them have silica cell walls, or the one on the far right there has a cellulose cell walls. There are differences amongst them, even though they all photosynthesize. And the differences is what makes it quite unique. And when you look at these things, you can say, well, I can see some that really look like they have silica. Do you see any that look like they have really rigid, really rough cell walls? Any, guy, any ideas? This is like a class you're supposed to speak now. <laughs> Which ones look soft and gooey? Mitch says the one on the right. Oh, thank God for Mitch. Okay, and the one up on the left here looks like a very rigid cell wall, right? All right. The one on the right-hand side is a dinoflagellate. Interesting word. Dino means uh, like, a, like a dinosaur, ancient. It's got uh, scales. The one on the right, right, left, your left, yeah, is a member of the diatoms. It's a group called the Bacillariophyceae. Okay, now, here's, here's, I have done this for 30 years, and I'm not gonna stop now. That is a word you cannot say without smiling afterwards. You can't, it's impossible. So I'm gonna ask you to say Bacillariophyceae and try not to smile. You ready? We'll do it on three. One, two, three. Bacillariophyceae. Other than Dr. Cummins over there, we did okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Bacillariophyceae, just a long word for the word diatom. The one on the bottom left here and the one on the far right there contain two of the most dangerous compounds on Earth. The one on the right makes a compound called saxitoxin. It was used in all the CIA operatives in the 1960s and 70s. Whenever they put something on the end of an umbrella and poked the spy and they quickly succumbed to death, it was a compound from that species. Saxitoxin for many years. Most toxic compound, no. The one on the left here is my friend, Pseudonychia, the one that's going to follow the rest of our story. And it does make a toxin compound. We'll get to talk about it in a second. All right. That second's over, here it is. <laughs> okay, so again, the diatom, pseudonychia on the left, 20 microns, 40 microns, it comes in lots of different varieties. It is a new species. Well, not really a new species, but it is a new phenomena. It makes a compound on the right-hand side that it only it makes, and it's called demoic acid. Not demonic acid, which is, uh, kind of spiritually based, but demoic acid. Demoic acid is just a small amino acid. And when it gets into human body or mammal, mammalian bodies, it accumulates in the base of the spinal cord and it binds to the glutamate receptors and it causes memory loss, asphyxiation, death. Most of those are not good, okay. But you have to accumulate it somehow. The traditional way, to, way of accumulating it is through the food chain. The pseudonychia is eaten by the krill, is eaten by the mussels, and then is eaten by the mammals. So you see here on the bottom right-hand side, they almost got it right, 
sea lions hit by high levels of acid poisoning in California. Now that's the New York Times, usually they get it right. It's not acid poisoning, it's domoic acid poisoning. That makes a difference, okay? But it's rampant along the west coast of the U.S. right now. It's a serious problem. It can, will kill, uh, it kills between 400 and, I don't know, whatever the number will be, but it's around 2,000 sea lions a year. But that's just one example. Here's how fresh this really is. There's a nice plate of mussels. Might have those for dinner tonight, right? Maybe not. <laughs> there we go. First occurrence, 1987 in Prince Edward Island. Okay, now, 1987, the start of my career, you know, there's no coincidence there. I'm sure that I'm not really related to the, the, the outbreak, but the point is, this hasn't been on for hundreds of years. First time it was ever associated with a diatom, pseudonychia, contaminating mussels, people eating the mussels, and dying. In the range of 150 people, quite ill, 120 went to the hospital, three died. All right. The National Research Council of Canada burst into activity and sorted this out within a year. Pretty phenomenal from a problem in the environment to the reason why. But it's probably been around since the 1960s. Not in Prince Edward Island, very few places, but in Santa Cruz or Monterey Bay in California. We don't have a lot of chemical evidence for this, and we have no taxonomic evidence, but we have some pieces of evidence that make it, make it logical. First of all, in, in um, Monterey Bay, it's very common now to have sea lion deaths because of this. And in the 1960s, here's the, the headlines, seabird invasion hits coastal homes. For some reason, all the seabirds suddenly went crazy. Here's a big, you know, picture of a uh, sheriff here trying to get the bird off his window. And it's thought to be a neuro the neurological damage of domoic acid getting into the bird population. Now, a small industry came up from this because one of the people living in the Santa Cruz area was Alfred Hitchcock, so <laughs> here it is. The movie The Birds. Where do you think he got his idea from? Domoic acid poisoning. So now you can't watch that movie without thinking, oh, it was something in the water. <laughs> yes. Okay. A little bit of background for those who are physiologically I mean, uh, interesting, interested. Again, it binds to the glutamate receptors in the hypocalamus and causes tissue degeneration. Pretty interesting. So. Yeah, there's your hypocamus, and here it is. This is it, and this is it on domoic acid. Much smaller, much more reduced. Long-term exposure causes serious developmental problem, even in large organs, or so large organisms. And it hits a whole slew of organisms. The, again, the only organism that seems to be immune to this whole process is the What was it? Fur seals. Hey, you were paying attention. I thought you'd already nodded off. Okay. 1999, the locations where kills had occurred were relatively small. By 2005, they had expanded because the level of knowledge had increased a little bit and there was a better relationship. And then when we did a survey in 2012, we recognized that it's a little more distributed in this world. There it is. Okay, so a couple things here. People are more aware of the species so they can observe it. So there's an observer effect. There is more interest in the species so there are more people out there trying to observe. But also, there's this idea that it is spreading constantly through our waters. And we don't know, sometimes they're toxic, sometimes they're not toxic. Only the, the peach colored areas along the coast are areas where they're found to be toxic right now but we don't really know. But it's a, an emerging problem, and it required good answers. 
answered at a kind of an oceanographic scale. And that's the team that, that is going to do the work that we've been after. Now, I should point out that these are highly, with exception of one, highly, highly respected researchers. Uh, I won't say which one is a little suspect, but it's the one whose name's not up there. Okay. But this group of individuals are the ones that I've worked with since 1999 on the domoic acid problem. And it's part of the theme of interdisciplinary work. Dr. Trainer is a toxicologist. Dr. Wells works on, tox on metal speciation. Dr. Coughlin on the right hand side works on nutrients that drive the formation of phytoplankton blooms. And I do, well, we're never really sure what Dr. Trick does, but he does something in the group. Now I'm going to say something here which is kind of, it might on the surface seem arrogant, but early on in our career, uh, a kind of a famous, or an editor of a famous journal in a review said we were the dream team for pseudonychia research. Now, we took dream team very seriously. Not that we were very good at doing what we're doing, but because they thought we had created a team that had the potential to do something. So periodically, well periodically, over the last 20 years, we've constantly reminded ourselves that whenever we came up to a barrier, a problem, something we hadn't thought about, that somebody had told us that we had the capacity to challenge it. That the team itself, maybe the individuals had no capacity, but the teams had a capacity. So this has strengthened our work forever and it has kept us quite humble. Okay. So they, we set off to do the first set of studies of what regulates and stimulates the production of toxins and the release of the toxins into the environment affecting humans. So this is one of the first real studies linking oceans and ocean health, bridging the gap between the environment and public health of the communities. The big study area was off the coast of British Columbia in Washington State, where the Strait of Juan de Fuca comes roaring out after it had got its water and wastes from Victoria, Vancouver, and Seattle. And it enters in the Pacific Ocean, and it makes a big vortex. It's called an eddy in, in the ocean terms, but it's a big vortex where things get mixed up, and you get all the nutrients that are supplying the growth of cells. And as it spins off, the cells start to move down the coast and they start to form bigger and bigger blooms or formations and then they suddenly become toxic and periodically shift and move to shore. The people on standing on shore are clamors. Historically, getting materials from, that, from the coastal waters and using them for either subsistence food or recreational food or uh, traditional foods for the, first, for the tribes there. So our model looks like something like this. There's a, what we call the crock pot. That's where everything forms in that big spot in our mark number one. And as it spins, it releases the cells. And the cells sometimes go north, they sometimes go south, and sometimes they get that right trajectory like a baseball pitcher to shift it send it all the way to the beaches and affect humans. And our job was to study the environmental conditions that caused that to occur. And National Science Foundation gave us a fair amount of money to do this. We did eight research cruises. They all looked about the same as this. It's a very, it's called brute force oceanography. You go out, you map the area, and then for a six week period, Every one of those spots you go when you study the bejesus out of that spot. And you try to piece it all back together and try to figure out what's the relationship between the chemistry, the physics, the biology, and the toxicology. I put this piece up here without very much data because every cruise was different. Well, every one of the first six cruises was different. We learned almost nothing 
doing brute force oceanography. There was no correlation between any one parameter that we studied and the levels of toxin or where the cells were going. Now that's, I, I would say that's fairly disappointing data. Certainly disappointing to our funding agencies. And with two cruises left, we figured we better figure out a better way of doing this. So we tried to sort out, well, let's not map it this way, let's follow the, let's follow the water. And we invoked some physical oceanographers to come and assist us or to teach us how to do this. And we set out these little tiny buoys. You can change the shape of oceanography, or at least our oceanography. Here's, the, you can see the ship, that's the big blue thing. And in front of it is the buoy. Okay, it's about a foot across. It looks like uh, four little tennis balls with a radio antenna. And that's basically what it is. And we put out 30 of these. Some went, and they float with the water. Some went north, past British Columbia. Some just stayed around. Some headed out towards Japan. They're probably still on their way. And then several of them started to take the trajectory that we were hoping to follow. That in the eddy, on the right-hand side there, the cells would start to grow. And as the cells grow, they would work their way back to the shore at the far side and have that intersection between the shore, or the people on the shore, and what's formed in the ocean. And we followed this, and we were quite excited about following this for weeks. Um, and what we were no normally noticing is that this, as the cells, as the water moved, the cell population kept getting higher and higher and higher and higher. But they weren't any more toxic. So it looked like they were going to crash to the shore and uh, not much of a real public health problem. But just before, near the end of that line there, the cells suddenly turned on all their toxin. And they converted most of their carbon material into demoic acid. That's what this line is here. Very low demoic acid. And then suddenly they're making tons. That really is tons. Again, 20 million cells per mil, several nanograms of toxin per cell, 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers square of cells, a lot of toxin. We are quite excited because now we're going to watch it swing by and intersect the land. Well, it didn't do that. Instead, all the cells blew up. They lysed. Not sure why, but it released all the toxin into the water. And that's not good because it started a new series of worry, this new type of experiment. This is what, like, what it looks like working on a ship. Most people are inside the ship with their analytical equipment, their sampling equipment, etc. But a certain number of us always work on the back deck. So when we're sitting out on the back deck, by the way, if you think you have problems organizing your lab, that is what it looks like as we're trying to just start our experiments. We have uh, like eight container trucks full of equipment that come to the ship and we spend a week building a lab on the ship. Okay. And then we work out doing all sorts of sampling experiments, but on the deck. So some individuals such as myself spent most of the time on the deck. The cells blow up, they release the toxin, and I become the one data point to verify that demoic acid has an aerosolic form. Because by the time we got back, and I got back home to London, I, um, I couldn't lift up my arms anymore. It was amazing. It was I mean, not amazing, well, <laughs> bit disturbing. <laughs> but I would go to class. Okay, because, you know, they expect you to teach when you come back. And I would start on the board here, and within two minutes, I'd be done here. And within ten minutes, I'd be done here. And by the time the class was over, I'd be writing from the hip. You know, just my arm stuck here. I had accumulated enough demoic acid to damage all the neurons on my shoulders. Uh, a great, great experimental point. 
you don't learn it till a little bit after, but we have it kind of verified that yes, there's an aerosolic form of domoic acid that nobody had ever seen. So trying to go through all the, the data. Okay, domoic acid causes uh, memory loss. You have to be dumber. <laughs> and the neurological thing. So, okay, I know the neurological. So I go ask my friends from the dream team, am I dumber now than before the ship? <laughs> and they would say, of course, how's that even possible? <laughs> yeah, it's not possible, okay. Um, do I have memory loss? What, what do you, what'd you say? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. So uh, it made me totally fascinated with the pathway of ecotoxicology. How do we get exposed? Why would the cell suddenly seek damage to me? I was not doing any damage. I was just on the back of the ship. Why did it explode? So they, they, kind of these, um, these problems. So while I'm whining and complaining, of course, cells are constantly moving towards or damaging the real population, the people that are seeking like the mussels, uh, the clams, etc. This is what the Washington State Shore looks like on a weekend. Not, not every weekend because they close it down periodically or else there wouldn't be any clams left. But they rush out there. It's a very recreational process. It's also a very traditional process for the First Nations. How do they, how do they survive? They could have, those cells could have showed up on shore all the clams have toxin. They go home and they will die from eating five or six mussels. You don't have to eat a lot. It's like Russian roulette. Well, I can't just sit back as a scientist and say, well, we couldn't kind of figure out what's going on, so I'm going to move on to another subject. All right. So, Dr. Trainer, the one that was hanging upside down, Okay, she periodically has good ideas too, hanging out, so I was not one of them. But, oh, sorry, I, was, I got a little ahead of myself. This is how frequently it occurs. Now, you don't have to know very much about this other than when the peaks are high, you don't eat it. When the peaks are down at the bottom, you can eat it. So how do you know this pattern? How can you figure it out? Here's how you normally do it. Now, just think about this. You're bringing your family to the beach. You have a big bucket of clams. You want to figure out, can we have clams tonight? Well, first you dig for the clams. Or somebody that's digging with you is shipping some of them to the Department of Health. They're doing a mouse bioassay, which takes 72 hours to run. And if there's a problem, they're going to phone and say, okay, stop them digging clams. But you can imagine in the 100 hours, people have accumulated a fair number of clams and there's a good chance that they could be sick or die. It's very dangerous. And again, you know, my, my kids are here. I don't want them to be the test species that, well, I think you can eat the clams. I, I, they look pretty good to me, okay? Uh, so you have to find a better way of doing it. Now, British Columbia has just said simply this, no digging clams. That's it. We will not be responsible for it, so don't dig it. Dr. Trainer came up with this idea, which we exported around the world. Simply, train communities to be the sentinel. Get the communities that are involved to do part of the science job. And you have to shorten it so that we're all protected. So in this case, they simply, they go out every day and they collect plankton the phytoplankton. They have a net, we give them nets, give them all sorts of equipment, they collect the little data. And they pick it up and they go to the microscope and they look not for all the beautiful cells, but simply just pseudonychia. If pseudonychia is not in the water, the community rushes out and digs clams. If pseudonychia is in the water, then they ask the question, is it toxic or non-toxic? So with uh, uh, industrial health, they've developed some toxin measurement schemes that work like uh, pregnancy samplers. You grind up some of the tissue from the clams, you put it on the sampler and it tells you whether there's toxin or not. It doesn't tell you if there's lots or just tells you whether it's toxic. 
if it's toxic, then they ship it to the main lab. If it's not toxic, then they keep going back and getting clamps. Okay, so the community now protects itself. And it alleviates hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of non-toxic samples being processed by the main lab. Because the main lab will now process them only if they fail the toxin strip. So we've exported this around the world where they don't have a lot of experience. Uh, and I want to just kind of finish off by talking about that. So same type of things. We've gone, well, you'll see in a minute that we've gone to four or five places in this world where we are training communities to be the sentinel, the controller of their seafood safety because there's not enough protection in the normal community. It takes a lot of face to face. This is where you have to import psychology, okay? Getting people to tell you what the real problems are. Getting people to admit that they can't handle the situation and there are new alternatives. But we talked with a lot of fishermen. We tried to figure out all the scientific capabilities. We build relationship with the governments, which is odd at times. I can tell you that more than one individual are always packing a gun when they come to visit us. Uh, we must look wildly threatening. And then we build a training program. This is the hardest part. Who do you train and how do you train them? You can train them with the science. Science is easy. Training them the mentality to do science is much more difficult. Not every society respects science as a mode of living. In other words, science is something somebody else does. We don't do it in our culture. But if you want to protect your resources, you want to protect your community, we need somebody to do this. So we trained a whole bunch of different types of individuals, sometimes university individuals, sometimes the librarian, sometimes the army. Okay, we could run classes on all the topics you would need to be the, the master of your domain with regards to seafood safety. And of course, we have to have award ceremony where everybody gets a diploma and a pat on the back and off and a microscope. I know the microscope, that's the, the secret, okay? So everybody gets microscopes, they go home with their study pack, cell phone, and they contact us whenever they see things or when they're, they're worried about things. The types of, again, the types of individuals that we work with, <coughs> highly variable, okay? The top one, the one on the top, this is in Guatemala, in the south, east, west portion. They're fishermen. Problem is, they overfish their waters. There's nothing left. There's nothing forward them, for them to do. The guy with the hat that says Los Angeles at the top, I'll never forget this guy. He said, we're the last fishermen on earth. There's nothing more. There's nothing left. So they're starting a clamming business a muscle business. Well, they better know whether it's toxic or not, so we're training them as a co-op. So now we have to bring the econ economics of the process into the picture. It gets quite complicated. Guatemalan Army, or sorry, Navy, great, wildly enthusiastic. We got a sample from Guatemala to show them, to ask them if they were, you know, to go through the procedure we just bought it from a fisherman and brought it in and had about 60 uh, cadets there working away and just said, well, you know, if you happen to find one that's toxic on that little pregnancy strip, just raise your hand. And but we've done this 20 or 30 times, nothing ever happened. So we're not paying great attention and suddenly hands going up all through the place. The bag that we got was highly toxic. So we had to rescue that bag from going to the market. So now we talk about economics again. How do you buy this from a fisherman that knows that you really want to buy it? <laughs> okay, yeah. It became extreme, one of the most extremely expensive bags of mussels you could ever imagine. But the previous year in the same location, 60 people died 
permeating contained in muscles. So it's not a trivial problem. This isn't the only kind of toxin we can look at. One of my favorite places is in the Cook Islands, which is 600 kilometers north of, uh, kind of, north of New Zealand. They get a species that's not Pseudonychia, but looks like that little flat clam up there, but it's only 20 microns across. It makes a toxin that gets into the puffer fish here, which then the people eat. Well, that's not a big problem. Here's where the problem is. Society has decided that the Cook Islands would be a great place for tourism to go, tourists to go. 10,000 people, 100,000 tourists. Well, if there's 100,000 tourists there, they better protect that reef. See the reef there? They better protect it. So they make it a marine protected area. So the puffer fish there swim through there without anybody ever picking them out of the water. They get fat, lazy, and accumulate an enormous amount of this toxin. So every fish in there is extremely, extremely toxic. Well, the economics mean that when you make a marine protected reef, which sounds like a good idea to us, right? Oh, it's so beautiful, a marine protected reef, we can go diving. You've taken the livelihood of thousands of individuals that used to be subsistent, subsistent fishers, and you've taken it away. So they run out at night, pick out these fish, and try to sell it in the market. But the fish are, I don't know, 30, 50 times more toxic than they were before it was a protected area. So we have to stop that somehow. That's a very difficult process. They recognize that it causes ciguatera uh, fish poisoning, which is a neurological damaging disease that they get. They don't want it. They know that sometimes the fish are toxic, sometimes they're not. So they have a strategy for seeing if the fish is toxic. They give it to their dogs. They dry it, take off a strip, give it to the dogs, and see if the dog goes into some sort of neurological fit. If it does, they feel bad, and they take the dog to the vet. So we got invited by the vets to solve the problem because they ran out of room. It takes three months to cleanse a dog from being toxic. And all you saw when you went to the vet place was crate after crate after crate after crate after crate of dogs that are on some sort of level of recovery. They don't have the capacity to deal with this. And the Cook Islanders love their dogs, so they want them back. They want them fixed. So kind of to sum up here, we've created three and a half training centers. We've done it in the Philippines, Guatemala, and Indonesia. To do those, we've had to be really successful in taking scientific principles, not on just the, the toxicology or the ecology, but also on what motivates individuals to maintain a monitoring system when most of the time they're going to recognize the waters are safe, but sometimes they're not. So we've gone to the business school to try to get understanding of scenario analysis, threat analysis, and trying to get that in part of their discussion. A very complicated process, because usually what happens is they, they are excited about the algae for a week, maybe, two weeks. They have a new microscope, three weeks. And then they kind of keep forgetting to do the samples. So people are thinking they're being protected but nobody's looking at the samples anymore. So we have to work on that. And the other half is in the South Pacific Islands, Cook Islands being an example. All right. I'd just like to um, remind ourselves that to make these decisions, you have to kind of give up some aspect of your science and gain other aspects of your science. And so you start to become, uh, well, it's kind of like a stack of pancakes. Okay, you have your basic sciences, that's good, and you have to add on new sciences, new interdisciplinary understanding for each stack. And you can't give up any of those for this whole process to work. And it's absolutely rewarding. I really love the opportunity 
to be able to do interdisciplinary science because it keeps me vibrant and alive and rewarded. When you go downstairs or when you go out here, you'll see a lot of posters for the interdisciplinary project that we are kind of uh, more known for on campus, which is the Lake Navasha Sustainability Project. I want you to spend, I'm hoping you might spend a little time at each of those posters because four individuals on campus, myself, Dr. Creed, Dr. Bend, and Dr. Darnell, worked very hard to create an interdisciplinary team where we constantly trained each other on how to be successful in a variety of different aspects of that project. The project ran for five years. It seemed like it was 25 years, but it was only five years. We generated 23 different theses. They went from understanding the historical attributes of the lake by doing cores, by looking at the toxins in the lake, mercury in the lake, variety of other uh, pesticides in the lake, and then up on shore looking at human activity, uh, levels of stress in their hair, levels of pesticide in their blood. Well, I actually haven't done that one yet, but we have all the samples. And then different anthrop anthropological aspects about why um, uh, the, the effect of bringing individuals into that community as well. It was very rewarding, and I know that um, many of you are um, on that verge of trying to figure out what you can add to your plate of scientific experiences. I, I'm hoping you will feel comfortable enough to step outside your discipline and bring some new tools in. So thank you.